Hi, everyone. Um, so Dominic is always a difficult act to follow. Uh, Dominic and Merritt uh, together are a doubly difficult act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, I just found out a few minutes ago that this is a psychoanalysis conference. Who knew? Um, so I apologize in advance. Uh, I'll be talking uh, about these, uh, some of the things that we've been hearing about for the last uh, couple of days. I'll be talking about them from, um, I think, a very different perspective, um, but uh, Dominic's film uh, has, has begun to, to put us into that space a little bit. Um, I'll be talking about mountaineering, not as a metaphor, right, <laughs> but actual mountaineering. Mountains have long held a privileged place in the stories humans tell about themselves and their environment. But their cultural significance has recently narrowed to a focus on climbing and climbers. As the ongoing scandal surrounding Mount Everest demonstrates, climbing has come to be about much more than climbing. Once a practice associated with limitless growth and human exceptionalism, Climbing is increasingly, increasingly situated in imaginaries of environmental degradation and civilizational collapse, and in a more and more urgent concern about what counts as meaningful action in a vulnerable world. At stake is nothing less than the dynamic interdependence of what is called the environment with the affective, imaginary, and libidinal aspects of human life. Now, before I begin, I would like to overstate something, if I may. My own goal has little in common with what is typically called philosophy of mountaineering. There is such a thing, right? Mountaineering literature abounds in philosophical and mostly ethical reflection. But it either suffers from banalities and truisms, like you can do it, right? Or it's irrelevant outside of the philosophy of sport. But climbing, in fact, um, yields new and unexpected insights into our always more than human predicament. As long as one manages to avoid the tired, facile dichotomy between the critique of mountaineering's colonial, ableist, and androcentric legacy on the one hand, and uncritical celebrations of heroics, extreme sports, and nation on the other hand. The recent rise of interest in climbing active in the form of commercialized mountaineering and climbing walls and college gyms and corporate offices, and passive in the form of an explosion of mountaineering literature and visual culture in corporate advertising, cinema, and social media, <clears throat> is not just a fad, I want to argue, but a deeper cultural symptom for which I'd like to offer something like a diagnosis. And now that I've said that in a room full of psychoanalysts, I can just die in shame, right? <clears throat> I'm going to begin with something that Alex Honnold, the American rock climber currently considered the greatest free solo climber in the history of the sport, likes to say in interviews. He likes to say that the key to climbing is knowing when to quit. <coughs> this applies in the small sense as in knowing when to go home for the day because you're tired, right? But it also applies in the larger sense as in knowing when to stop altogether. However, since the explosion of Himalayan mountaineering in the early 20th century, the world has swooned over the madness of climbers and precisely their refusal to quit, even or especially in the face of great risk. Today, this infatuation seems more pervasive than ever. Jarring reports this past climbing season have described climbers waiting in line at Everest's peak while others take selfies at the summit. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> In response to the well-worn question, why climb, Sir John Hunt, who was the leader of the 1953 expedition, which resulted in the first ascent of Everest by Hillary and Norgay, and the author of The Conquest of Everest, wrote, the possibility of entering the unknown. These days, of course, Everest is anything but unknown, so commercialized that it's become symbolic of a world used up by humans crawling with amateur adventurers who can afford it and littered with the corpses of those who can't make it down. 
The crowds, and this is how they are described in the media reports, the crowds are leaving behind piles of litter, and struggling climbers have said that other climbers have ignored their pleas for help en route to the summit. <clears throat> now, leaving behind injured, hypothermic, or otherwise struggling climbers to fend for themselves has long been the stuff of beloved accounts of both death and survival in high-altitude mountaineering. On Everest, <coughs> Excuse me. On Everest, there are no explicit rules about helping others. And forging ahead to ensure one's own survival is actually common. The recently publicized problems on the mountain, however, have brought this code of conduct under widespread public scrutiny for the first time. Many people have responded with, with rage, outrage, <coughs> calling for more safety precautions and altruism on the mountain. These demands say less about climbers than they do about us, right, the public watching them, or rather about what the summiting of this legendary mountain has come to mean in recent years. We're becoming aware of something like an Everest industry in which groups are profiting off the mountain at every level, from the Nepalese government selling a record number of permits last year to pop-up companies offering to take even the most inexperienced climbers to the top. Nepal's tourism board <clears throat> has claimed that the problems on Everest are, are unrelated to high numbers of climbers. And it remains unclear <clears throat> if Nepal, a third world country that significantly benefits from mountaineering tourism, has any plans to restrict access to Everest. But the question of permits alone will not determine the mountain's future. Something much more abstract is at stake. Now, <clears throat> Perhaps, perhaps Everest should actually be closed. Such a move would be more complicated than it appears, however. The loudest protests would undoubtedly come from the climbers themselves. Sorry, from climbers themselves. But probably not the most uh, skilled ones who already have access to, and in many cases, more interest in the less frequented Himalayan peaks. The greatest impact would be on climbers for whom Everest is the best or only Himalayan opportunity. <clears throat> and correspondingly, on the local Sherpa community, sorry, on the local Sherpa support economy that has been built around the mountains. The Sherpa are pro climbers, professional climbers in the truest sense. They are paid to guide others into the Himalaya, and many of them die while doing their jobs. Any moves to permanently close off the summit or drastically lower the number of permits issued per year would have to seriously consider the impact on Sherpa communities currently engaged in their own debates about their future as climbers. There might be large-scale relocations as if a natural disaster had taken place. In a sense, though, a disaster is precisely what has happened. The disaster is not just the traffic jam near the, su near the summit of Everest or the high death count. Skyrocketing economic, economic growth affects mountain environments on every level. Due to climate change, the Himalayan peaks are warming between 0.3 and 0.7 degrees Celsius faster than the global average, with devastating consequences for the 1.65 billion people living in the mountains and downstream countries who are at risk of flooding and the destruction of crops. So between Himalayan warming, which is growth at its most abstract and hardest to mitigate, and the zoo and garbage dump on Everest, and these are, um, these are words I'm taking directly from titles uh, 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 of articles, right, written in the last few climbing seasons. <coughs> And the zoo and garbage dump on Everest, which is growth at its most sort of obvious, right, and tangible, the scale and complexity of the recent damage to the Himalayan region is only now beginning to come into view. So I wanted to sort of paint that, that picture for you. That's one set of questions and problems that I really won't be dealing with today, okay? A different one opens up when we imagine <clears throat> the closure of Everest, not only in terms of physical access, right, but in terms of something like a cultural demotion. What we lose when we lose Everest in that second sense is what I think Greta Thunberg means when she yells at the UN, you have stolen my dreams. 
<coughs> how we navigate mountains as a symbolic or semiotic terrain right, depends on what history we tell of how we have arrived at this point. The most important recent academic literature about mountaineering is by historians, including historians of music, politics, and literature. These sweeping works focused on the, focus on the relation of climbing to Europe and to modernity. They convincingly establish that since Petrarch stood on the summit of Mont Ventoux sometime in the mid 1300s, the first recorded person to ascend a mountain just to see the view from the top, we are told. The development of mountaineering has, has closely followed and mirrored that of modernity. So that by the end of the 18th century, mountains and mountaineers were at the center of colonial knowledge production. Think of your very own Alexander von Humboldt. <clears throat> and the new discipline of aesthetics, right? Think of Kant. The story here is one of continuity over time as climbers sort of summited higher and higher peaks, right? Moving out of Europe into Asia. <coughs> in this framework, Everest is just another mountain in the story, right? It just happens to be the highest one. But perhaps there's another way to tell this story of how we arrived here. In popular culture and ordinary understandings of mountaineering, sort of in everyday understandings of mountaineering, the practice, the very problem space that I want to call mountains and desire, began not centuries ago, but about a century ago with the European Himalayan expeditions. I hold that it was actually George Mallory's Everest Reconnaissance Expedition of 1921 that inaugurated contemporary climbing culture. And by this, I mean not just the culture of climbing itself, but the shifts in culture in general that today put climbing center stage. By declaring the summit of Everest, i.e. the limit of the world, right? By declaring it possible, achievable, right? The expedition infused climbing with new life and meaning, making it the ultimate theater for bodily optimization, liminality, questions of, of limits, right? And indeed, I want to argue, desire. <coughs> now, Alongside the popular consensus that Everest has been trashed by amateurs, emerges the simultaneous success of Free Solo, the 2018 documentary about Alex Honnold's historic ropeless climb of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park in California, which won the Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. The climbing body is suspended somewhere between its pre-human origins and its post-human future. Paleoanthropologists argue contentiously over the role of climbing in hominid evolution, <laughs> examining the various possibilities for reading the histories of arborealism and terrestrial bipedalism in early hunter-gatherers. A new bio-inspired climbing robot currently in the making, created by a team at the University of Genoa, is modeled on primate locomotion because primates, all different kinds, from masaks to chimps, are the fastest and most efficient animals at climbing. Meanwhile, the liminal character of climbing, especially obvious at high altitudes where the, high, where the human body is constantly on the verge of its physiological efficiency, right? We can't do any more physiologically than what high altitude mountaineers do. <clears throat> presages the coming stage of human development. And indeed, Alex Honnold's ropeless accomplishments over the past decade seem actually impossible for a human body to do, and for a human mind to do, psychoanalysis. Free Solo shows him getting an MRI of his brain so that researchers might understand the particularities of his amygdala, which I understand is the brain's fear center, which in Honnold appears to have a much higher threshold of stimulus than in control subjects. Quitting while ahead is at the heart the happy ending of Free Solo, as Honnold looks squarely into the camera and announces, less than convincingly, that the next climbing achievement on that scale, but he says it's going to be bigger and cooler, will be by some kid, probably not me, he says. 
And yet, Honnold himself is a great example of a climber who has achieved what he has precisely because he didn't stop while ahead. In one oft-quoted piece of footage from an earlier film of his soloing of Half Dome in 2011, he is momentarily paralyzed with fear on a ledge, so much so that he cannot move, either forward or back, or even explain to the filmmaker what's happening to him. Right? The film then cuts to him climbing happily to the top despite this minor setback. I want to, show, I want to um, share this clip with you. How do I make it play? Now Alex has now done the regular route on Half Dome free solo. So for most people on this planet who are serious climbers, doing Half Dome in a day or two is considered fantastic. Alex did it in three hours without a rope. You know, you commit, you're like, I'm doing this, here I go. But then after like a couple hours of being all committed, you're like, man, I'm tired. And like, you know, your, your mind starts to get a little bit tired. And so I kind of stalled out and then I started to doubt if I was doing it right or if I had the right holds. Why am I even here? You know, do I want to do this? Um, Just come back if you're not feeling it. Well, that's the thing is I'm like... And that stalled him out, that paralyzed him. And then he overcame it. He didn't work that route a hundred times. He just got up below it, looked up at it, and believed, absolutely believed, it was well within his ability. Okay. <coughs> I don't know if you guys caught that, but the guy says, hey man, you can come back if you're not feeling it. And he says, that's the thing. I'm like, that's the end of the sentence. That's the thing I'm like, right? And then, of course, he overcomes it. That's, uh, I, I don't know how, if, if you, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, the, the films of Honnold um, or about Honnold. I'm, I'm very used to this by now because I, I watch these all the time. Uh, so it's normal for me <laughs> to see like this person sort of clinging to, you know, this, this face of this mountain with no ropes. Um, but th that's the theme in, in, this, uh, in, in these films over and over again. It's the theme of overcoming fear, right? Overcoming barriers. There are no boundaries. Um, one of the most famous speed climbers in the history of mountaineering, Uli Steck, whom I, I assume I don't have to introduce here, right? Also called the Swiss machine, famously fell to his death on April 30th, 2017, while training for yet another Everest ascent. So this was about two months before Honnold did that historic climb of El Cap. <clears throat> when climbers die, the public response is equal parts, well, what did you expect, right? And shocked disbelief. So Steck's body was autopsied, as if it weren't possible that he might simply have slipped and fallen, right? Likewise, the two speed climbers who fell from El Capitan in 2017 caused a media flurry of speculations about, quote, overconfidence, miscommunication, and complacency, as if falling while simul climbing for time could only result from error, right, and couldn't just be a sort of natural event that happens when you're doing this sort of work. <clears throat> in fact, I was, I'll tell you guys as an aside, <coughs> I was asked to write about that, um, those two climbers falling, and the editor said, I want you to write about the dark side of climbing. And I said, what, what do you mean, the dark side? And, and he said, well, you know, there are all these reports about foul play. And I'm like, dude, they fell. What is this foul play, unless you just mean life, in which case, <laughs> there's a lot there we could say, right? <clears throat> so... This tension, right, between what did you expect, of course they die, and oh my god, they died, right? This is just one of the many neuroses inside which free solo hangs suspended. <coughs> the entire premise is that to free solo El Capitan is pure madness, to which everyone in the film repeatedly attests, including his girlfriend, who says over and over, I don't understand why he wants this, 
And the other pro climbers in the film, right, these are, again, top elite climbers in the history of the sport. Uh, one of them is Tommy Caldwell, a superstar of the sport, and a specialist of this mountain in particular, right? He says, climbing with Honold is a vice, like smoking cigarettes. And he says, Alex Honold is the most likely to die. As the film's co-director and fellow climber, Jimmy Chin, ominously intones, quote, if you're pushing the edge, eventually you find the edge. Except that Honold doesn't. That's the big takeaway. Beneath Free Solo's finger-wagging about quitting while one is ahead, including a discussion of, of Steck's untimely death, flows a torrent of unstoppable passion to keep pushing the edge. This is precisely the aspect of mountaineering that has been exhaustively co-opted by the corporate imaginary. <coughs> the accomplished climber presents the apex of not only physical, but professional and financial achievement, the winner standing on top of the world. A famous 2011 Citibank ad featuring pro rock climber Katie Brown and our own Honold playing a couple on vacation performs this logic. Brilliantly. Oh, we don't have sound. To pick up some accessories, a new belt, some nylons, and what girl wouldn't need new shoes? We talked about getting a diamond, but with all the thank you points I've been earning, Somebody the gate I flew us to the rock I really had in mind. The City Thank You Card. Earn points you can use for travel on any airline with no blackout dates. <coughs> I don't know if you guys caught the, the text at the beginning. It, it goes by very quickly, right? It's, um, she says, she's, she's sort of talking about the accessories that a girl needs, right? A girl needs new shoes, a girl needs a new belt, right? And a rock, of course, because there's her boyfriend who's going to propose marriage, right? Um, but you get what the rock is, and you get what the shoes are, and what the belt is. So it's this, uh, it's this interesting, um, I mean, I, I find it a, a kind of a fascinating document, right, of uh, neoliberal capitalism. <clears throat> while most climbing rats, as they are called, built their careers while living out of cars, and wholly rejecting a traditional life of work and wealth building, this ad performs a sleight of hand in which one forgets what the ad is for, right? The superimposing of climbing onto a credit line creates a certain fantasy of upward mobility in which wealth and freedom are synonymous. The glorious GoPro and drone footage, now par, par for the course in all corporate advertising that uses climbers, has become a hallmark of what Dominic Pettman calls the corporate sublime. Today's climbing body is more often than not presented as a convergence of the values of performance, speed, and efficiency in perfect compliance with neoliberal fantasies of the individual who overcomes adversity and biopowers demand, as well as biopowers demand for docile bodies. Even the meditative qualities of climbing and being outdoors are hijacked by the optimizing logic that rules wellness culture today, <clears throat> which here converges with the above values to create the machines that pro climbers like Steck present to the public. <clears throat> um, Steck, who was sponsored by Audi and ING Swiss Bank, even states in his final video right before his death that everything counts as success short of death. There are no failures as long as you're climbing, or to quote the brilliant simple tagline of a recent campaign for Delta Airlines, quote, keep climbing. At stake is nothing less than the optimization of life. So there's no contradiction between the end of mountains and the beginning of climbing, to paraphrase a French philosopher. It's entirely possible to climb more and more dedicatedly precisely because one is climbing in the end times. And the end times for mountains means more than material exhaustion. Climbing is not just something that happens on the mountain's surface, not when the whole world is watching. It takes the form of cultural or semiotic extraction. It thus has its own peak, right? And I'm arguing that we are living that moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. As the corporate sublime presents climbing as success, 
the image works to naturalize advanced capitalism as if it were the most natural, obvious, spiritually and environmentally integrated way to be, as if it were freedom, and perhaps most insidiously, as if it were inevitable. Baudrillard had his doubts about this aspect of mountaineering back in 1988, claiming that such practices effectively exhaust their own meanings because they are pre-programmed to succeed before they even happen. <clears throat> it would never occur to anyone to attempt to climb unless they had decided ahead of time that it was, in fact, possible. Thus, when these ostensibly shocking ascents finally take place successfully, they are, culturally speaking, quote, of no consequence. He equates the Himalayan summits with the moon landing, in uh, which, he writes, has not revived, has not revived the, the dream of conquering space, but exhausted it. That's from America. <clears throat> of course, it's counterintuitive to describe achievements like those of Honold or Steck as being of no consequence. But Baudrillard's point is not about the effort, talent, work, and sacrifice required, but about the cultural meaning of the achievement. The free climb of El Capitan, which Honnold describes as the center of the rock climbing universe, apropos of space dreams, was culturally pre-programmed to succeed. And no one knows this better than climbers themselves. <coughs> When Steck broke the record for speed climbing the Eiger North Face for the second time in 2015, he seemed very happy to be sure, but not the least bit surprised. Nor will it surprise him, he says, immediately after breaking his own record, when that record is broken in turn. It's simply inevitable. Honnold, too, almost immediately following his own victory, predicts that someone will soon outdo him. And this, on top of the fact that Free Solo is the first time such a massive climbing achievement has been filmed in real time, thus creating the uncanny experience of a film premised on the question, will he make it, down to the nail-biting finale, when in fact, everyone watching knows that Honnold did indeed make it. So I'll show you this last clip, which is, this is from the film Free Solo. Um, it was really hard to, <coughs> excuse me, it was hard to figure out. Yes. Uh, sure. <coughs> He's climbing Yosemite Falls, so this is just a practice that you can This isn't the And there's always something that has to give you the confidence to go out and, and free solo a route. So sometimes that confidence just comes from feeling super, super fit. Sometimes that confidence comes through preparation and rehearsal. But I mean, there's always something that makes you feel ready. There's something to be said for like soloing a bunch of pitches to like get into that right space. It's a little stressful. It's just, it's unreal. And as much as I trust Alex, and I know that he's really methodical, if you're pushing the edge, eventually you, you find the edge. But then there's some things that you're like, well, you just have to push that far, because they're just, they're just that cool. And El Cap is that cool. There's incremental advances that happen in all kinds of things, but every once in a while, there's just this iconic leap Soloing El Cap, if he pulls this off, is this quantum leap. It is hard to imagine somebody up there by themselves without a rope, whereas pretty much all the other big cliffs around here, I, I can kind of get it. How many times have you soloed both those streets, Star? Well, Astro Man, three or four times, but the Rostrum, I mean, literally like 50, 60. Wait, you've sold the Rostrum 50 or 60 times? It was like so part of the circuit, up. and I would, I would I go there and I would do it at least twice. Like I was just glommed on. Huh. Not like out of fear, but just kind of like this yeah, is how- Yeah, because you're so just, tight. Yeah. No, I love that about someone. My footwork gets really good. Yeah, really. Yeah, totally. But yeah. it's not for anybody else. This is just Yeah, yeah. Just, just because for me. you feel and like that, After us, man, people are like, ah, oh, we want to film you, film you up there. And I'm like, not interested, not even slightly. For me, it was so incredibly important to be doing it for the right reasons. I mean, I. I think I'm still doing everything for the right reasons and yeah. I'm still totally stoked.
but I feel like from the outside observer, you know, they'd be like, oh, he's got a movie crew. Like, clearly that's the wrong reasons, you know? The worst thing about having a film crew is if it changes your mindset. it wasn't coordinated properly. Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm, I'm sort of very drawn to that last exchange, right, where uh, we, we once again come up with, we, we once again come, come up against the question, why do this, right? And no one ever answers this question, but there's this, there's this problem space that's opened up, the problem space of the right reasons, <laughs> right? So it's, it's presented to us that there are right reasons, aren't there, <laughs> right? That there are right reasons to do this. Um, and then that, that one would be able to identify when one is doing it for the right reasons right, at all. Um, so <clears throat> in conclusion, as a document of the present, Free Solo is much more than the story of this particular climb or even this particular climber. It provides, among other things, a framework for thinking about the complexity of the exhaustion of environments. In an interview from 2016, Uli Steck implied that the problem of Everest, that the problems of Everest were in fact much bigger than what the words the Everest industry can capture. And this is a quote from him. It's not just about money, and I can't give you the answer. You have to look at how the whole system works, end of quote. The whole system means that what, op what organizes the climbing reality and what in turn makes it so consumable and co-optable by, and first of all, so irresistible to the late capitalist imaginary, involves much more than just its economic logic. What we call the limits of the human body are never just bodily or just human. They always have terroir, so to speak, an environment in which what is possible must be carefully negotiated at every step. This terroir itself is not merely geographical or material, the environments in question signify, and they are imagined in particular ways. Their cultural meanings, just as much as their physical characteristics, shape what is and is not possible. And what in time becomes possible in culture and imagination, but also somatically, materially, in fact. <clears throat> Likewise, there is no recalcitrance of nature apart from particular desires that humans have of and in particular environments. Desire, bodily limits, and environmental recalcitrance are actually inseparable from each other. They give meaning to each other. And this meaning, what and how environments mean, is another resource that humans use up. What contemporary climbing culture shows is that environmental degradation is not just material. It's also cultural or semiotic. The exhaustion of environments is also necessarily more than environmental, something happening to and inside of humans and culture, no less than it is happening to and inside the non-human sphere. Thank you. And it's basically the same one that you post. Why do this? I was wondering, I mean, I've never, I've, I have to be honest, uh, I, I've never knew that there is such a discipline, um, the one that you're dealing with. So what, what, draw, what was that that drawn you to, to do this? Why do this? I mean, why do this? Yeah, exactly. Why do this? Yeah, why do this? What made you uh, <laughs> think of what they do and why they do it? And the other question is, if I can, um, uh, at the beginning, you said that you had and you would like to have another chance to discuss do with Dominic and maybe with what they did. Mm -hmm. So what would be the connection between your talk and what we yeah, saw? Good. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> um, I mean, I, 
so, so the first question is, is sort of impossible to answer, right? Uh, I frankly, when I, st when I started, the more I read about um, certain things, the, the less I can understand why anyone would do anything else. <laughs> so I wrote a book about, right before this, I wrote a book about whales. Not whales the country, right, but whales, right, the, the cetaceans. And people were like, you're a philosopher, why are you writing about whales? I'm like, why aren't you writing about whales, is the question. Um, you know, when you see something like Free Solo, which has it, have you guys seen this movie? Guys, come on, you gotta see this. I'm sorry, we should have just watched the movie. Um, I mean, it's, it's when, when you, or whenever you see, the, um, I, think, I think contemporary sort of extreme sports culture is fascinating. It's fascinating, okay, and this actually um, relates to your second question too. So for me, what interests me is, um, when people want something from the when people want something from the stuff, right? I think I think in Dominic's work, we we've, we've been asking this question of the of the uh, connection. This, you know, what is the carbon footprint of your libido? Um, it's it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but <clears throat> when we unpack it, we unpack it uh, slightly differently. He and I, right? For him, it's this kind of um, almost Fourierian uh, Fourierian kind of imaginary in which the world itself desires, right? So that desire just kind of is, and it's around, and uh, we are subject to it, right? Humans are subject to it, but they're certainly not the only ones subject to it. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm much more, I'm more interested in something much more literal. This idea that, that people in order to find themselves, which by the way is the answer we always get from people doing any sort of extreme sports today, right? I do this because I, I sort of, when I'm doing it, I know who I am, right? That in order to find themselves, people have to sort of confront these absolutely um, physically impossible situations, right? The situations that will, that, 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 that make them take the greatest risks of their lives, right? And then they know who they are. I'm, I'm very interested in that, in that, um, as a problem of libidinal ecology, right? Um, <clears throat> this thing I said at the end, that there is no such, th we keep hearing about the recalcitrance of nature and that, that in, the, um, in the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene is, is sometimes defined as this space in which, this, this moment at which there is no more recalcitrance of nature. There's no more nature, right? So there's no, that we don't, we, we're not gonna have the, the pleasure or the, the challenge, right? Or the, um, uh, the truth, right? That comes with nature saying no to us, right? Um, I'm not sure that there ever was any recalcitrance of nature. I think that idea makes sense only in the context of us wanting something from nature in the first place. That's when it gets to say no, right? So I'm not sure that nature is recalcitrant for the bears that are rubbing themselves against the trees in Dominic's film, um, in the same way that nature is recalcitrant for the climber, the rock climber who is attached to the rock, right, with, with her whole body. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so for me, you know, these are the, I'm, I'm, I'm interested, when we, when we talk about uh, advanced capitalism, I'm interested in what people are actually doing. Um, and bizarrely enough, I find that in these spaces of um, the kinds of extreme sports that need wilderness for their meaning, right? So. Um, for example, high altitude mountaineering, or speed climbing, or free climbing, or free diving, right? When divers are now going without scuba gear for longer periods than humans have ever like, been underwater. Um, the Five Deserts Marathon, which where you run marathons in every single like, you know, super hostile desert of the world, and it ends dramatically in Antarctica which is also a desert, right? So this is the, this is the sort of thing that fascinates me. I think, there's so, I think there's something to be mined. Terrible language of extraction, I'm sorry, but there's something, right, to look for there.
let's say, the submission, uh, the notion of the confronting yourself with limits, uh, with all this, let's say, this, this presuppositions on performance, on um, on a, 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 the language of the videos that you show. It's a very cultural industrial language with all these musics and uh, all this, this, let's say, this this air of of something big that is happening or something like that. It's uh, it's, it's really, let's say, it's really a, a very strict grammar of television and so on. Why not criticize that? Yeah, but you don't think that could be a problem? Well, a problem for what? Well, it's a, what you want to do, right? it's, it's, it's a way, let's say, to, to, to erase the possible meaning of the experience. Because it's an ex F Filming something is a way to erase No, no, but it's, it's not I'm, film, I'm, it's not just okay. film, but it's a film in this way. In, in, in which that language, uh, with this rhythm, with this music, okay. I think I understand. Um, I, I don't do that, and I've never done that, because I'm, I'm taking... What's interesting to me is that everyone is seeing this. This is what we have to work with, not some other f film that could be made. I mean, of course. Of course, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about popular culture here, right? So... Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in what that actually looks like. And if all I do is criticize what it looks like, then I never actually confront what it looks like or how, how it works, right? How it works. I don't know if that's a... Um, a simple question. Do you want to climb? No. <laughs> just, just like I'm not a whale. <laughs> um, no. <clears throat> but I have enormous respect for people who do this, right? I have enormous respect for, um, for I don't know how to, I don't know how to finish that sentence, notice, right? That's how enormous the respect is, right? Um, no, and I, and I, and I'm asked this a lot, right? Um, I almost, I almost don't really if I were to climb, it would just be really sad. <laughs> you know, I'd just be like this like, middle-aged person climbing. It would just be like, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in, in following the careers of these people, right? And following the stories that they tell us about themselves and trying to sort of read, read those against themselves, right? But really generously too. Because it kind of reminds me just now when you talk, you, I think you mentioned, like you, you said something like, um, it's kind of the same for those who actually climb to the edge and those who do not climb in terms of like the way that they actually pursue the desire of the impossible. Um, but then do you think that is also very different like in terms of when you say no, um, that no is come from a different place compared to a climber. I guess a no can be coming from the fact that I'm, initially leaving some form of carbon footprint in the way that I decide to love and pursue this sublime. Like it's kind of um, like a different distance, but then it's this different distance can also be seen in very um, different materialistic ground. Well, I mean, I think this might be related, <coughs> excuse me, related to the gentleman's question um, just a moment ago. These people are busy climbing, right? They're not good at, they're not the, they're not the best at telling the story of what's happening, right? They're, they're, they're too busy crushing, frankly, right? So who gets to tell the stories of what's happening? Who are the people who make the documents of this? And who interprets them for the public and how, right? Um, I'm interested in, in that game, which is sort of a different game, right, than climbing. I don't know if there's a question, but I remember I watched kind of like a, um, how you call that? backstage production of that movie yes. and they really want to maintain like a huge distance from the climber as if to give him like absolute solitude well, they, they not to, to communicate. They have to, right? Because what, I mean, if you haven't seen it, you, you don't know that this, this tension that's running throughout the film is that, I mean, first of all, what he's doing, right, is it's literally, they say it over and over, 
one mistake and you die. One mistake and you die. And that's it, right? So he keeps rehearsing the same routes with rope, right? He rehearses them over and over and over and over, preparing for this one event, right? That he's either going to do or he's going to die. It's literally that, right? Um, but one of the things that, uh, that's, that makes it especially dangerous is the presence of other people, the presence of cameras, and the presence of drones. So what we didn't see <clears throat> that well in the film, this is why I ended with this clip, right? Where the other climber asks, says to Alex Hano, um, as long as the cameras, as long as the presence of cameras don't change your, doesn't change your mindset. And Hanel just kind of looks down at his foot. And that's it, that's where it cuts, right? Because how could one answer, well, how, how does one know, right? How does one know when the presence of the cam, of course the presence of cameras changes your mindset. Right? And so, yes, distance, but not really distance. All the camera, all the, the whole film crew is all professional climbers, right? All of them. And it's interesting when you watch Honold um, at the Oscars, there's this, he gives an interview to uh, this, this, this Oscar lady, and this is before he gets the Oscar, and he's wearing his <coughs> custom-made North Face tuxedo, which North Face has made for him for this occasion, right? <coughs> this is before they receive it. And this woman's like, oh my God, you're Alex Honnold. This is so great. What's it like? Here, you know, here you're just this like climbing rat, but here you are at the Oscars. This must be so amazing for you. He's like, I just really don't care about this and she won't take it as an answer. And she says, but here you are at the Oscars, you know, surrounded by the greatest celebrities in the world. What's it like? And he says, I don't think you understand. I don't need the respect of those people, right? There's a whole other world whose respect I want, right? So, yeah, I have no idea why I just said that, <laughs> but it had something to do with what you were asking. <clears throat> about distance, right? About that it had to do with, with distance and, and, and creating sort of limits between these worlds of filming and climbing. Well, I mean... Well, Margaret, I think, I'm sorry. I'm it, just, it's uh, okay. You in the please, please continue with the sentence and then... Just yeah, and I want to say, watch Free Solo, and I, I actually think that there's, there's a ton there to look at. All I, all I looked at was a little piece that interests me, right? which is this, this, this connection between desire and environment, right? But there's so much more there to, to talk about, right? Precisely, and that's why I'm calling it the sort of special document for the times. <laughs>